now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Crime drama this hour, Dick Colmer, starring as Boston Blackie. This episode dates back to May 21st, 1946, and it is entitled The Blaine Brothers' Pawn Shop Murder. I don't see what you're complaining about, John. Oh, you don't, huh? Well, who owns this pawn shop, Paul? You, me, or both of us? We both do, you know that. Okay, then. From now on, I sign checks the same as you do. Now, wait a minute, John. You're getting your share of the profits, aren't you? So you say. Only I don't trust you. I'll get it. Hello. Hello. Wait a minute, this. Is anybody on here? Hello. Hello. Is this Blaine's pawn shop? Yeah, what do you want? Uh, I want to speak to Paul Blaine, please. Oh, you don't care who you speak to, do you? Just a minute. It's for you here. Thanks. Hello? Hello, Paul Blaine? Yeah? This is Boston Blackie. Uh, you wanted me to call you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I'm sorry about the way my brother spoke to you on the phone. We're having a little argument. That's all right. Uh, what do you want, Blaine? I'd, I'd like to see you. It's important. And, uh, well, could you get down here this afternoon? Well, I don't know. I... Uh, no, look, you got to come. It's awfully important. All right, Blaine. I'll be there about 3 o'clock. Okay, 3 o'clock. Uh, thanks. Goodbye. Hey, what kind of a deal you got cooking with Blackie, Paul? That's my own business. Now, look, John, I don't want any more trouble with you or... Oh, no, well, you're going to get it. Now, wait a minute, John, don't leave. Stop worrying about my leaving. But just start worrying if I come back. And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Oh, there's the pawn shop we want. Two doors down, Mary. Oh, yeah. Why did Paul Blaine want to see you, Blackie? I don't know, Mary. That's what I've come down here to find out. Well, that being the case, let's go in and find out. Here we are. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you Paul Blaine? Yes, I am. You must be Boston Blackie. Yes, and this is Mary Wesley. How, How do you do? Mr. Blaine? Well, you're right on time, Blackie. You said you'd be here at three, and it's, well, two minutes of three right now. I'm generally on time, Blaine. What do you want to see me about? Well, it's this, Blackie. I made a loan of $1,000 on a diamond yesterday, and this morning I found out it's stolen property. Uh Uh-oh. That's bad, isn't it? It's very bad, Miss Wesley. It means I may lose my $1,000. Oh. Well, what do you want me to do about it, Blaine? Well, I thought you'd take the diamond to the insurance company that carries a policy on it and make a deal so I could get my money back. Oh. Well, I suppose I could do that, but why can't you? Oh, they'd have no reason to bargain with me. They'd know I'd have to turn in the diamond to the police. And, well, I was hoping it wouldn't be too much trouble for oh, you to... Oh, Blackie's uh... so used to trouble, he's lonesome without it. Quiet, Mary. All right, but uh, I like that. That's what I like, modesty. Mm-hmm. All right, Blaine, I'll take the diamond. Oh, well, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, here, I have it here in my pocket. Okay, Ooh. Blaine. You'll hear from me tomorrow. Uh, about what time, Blackie? Mm, same time as now, 3 o'clock. Come on, Mary. Uh, okay, okay, see you at 3 tomorrow, Blackie. Goodbye and thanks. Goodbye and don't mention it. Let's wait here for care, Mary. All right. Blackie, will you be able to get Mr. Blaine's thousand dollars back? I think so, Mary. All I... That was a shot. And inside the store, too. Come on. Blaine. Blaine, where... Oh, there he is. Blackie, is... Oh... Oh, it, it looks like he's... Dead, Mary? Ooh. He has to be dead unless he was wearing a bulletproof heart. Yes, but, but who could have... I don't know. But whoever it was is probably out the back way by now. Well, here we go again. I guess I'd better call Faraday. No, darling, no. Please don't call Inspector Faraday. You didn't have anything to do with this, but Faraday will never believe you. All right, Mary. I guess the best way for us to stay out of this is to get out of here. <laughs> Hey, Rollins. Rollins, come in my office. Yeah, Inspector Faraday? What about some action on the murder of Paul Blaine, the pawnbroker? Inspector, there hasn't been a thing developed. Just a minute. Faraday speaking. Inspector, got a little news for you. You want to know who killed Paul Blaine, don't you? Sure. 
Do you know who did it? Well, I know who was in his store about the time he got bumped. Oh. Friend of yours, Boston Blackie. A friend of it? Bo- Hello. Hello. What was it, Inspector? Some guy who says Boston Blackie was at the scene of Paul Blaine's murder. Good. Hey, that's exactly what you want, isn't it? It should be, but it isn't. This is one time I don't think Blackie's involved. And besides, I waste too much time chasing that guy anyway. Gee, Inspector, you must be sick. Maybe that call was a straight tip. I doubt it. Besides, I got a line on Blaine's killer. Yeah, who? Never mind who. But Blaine sent a certain guy to prison about five years ago. Last week, that certain guy got out of prison. I think he killed Blaine for revenge. Could be, Inspector, but I'd still like to have a look around Blackie's apartment. Go ahead. Waste your time any way you want. But I'll bet I find a real killer before you find anything on Boston Blackie. <laughs> What's the matter? Mm. Uh, nothing, nothing, Helen. Something is, honey. You seem awfully upset. What is the matter? You read the paper you brought me? Only the headlines. I don't remember what they said, though. Well, uh, let me refresh your memory just a little. Mm-hmm. Yeah, listen to this headline. Huh. Cops looking for ex-convict and Blaine murder. Oh, yes, I remember that. Well, I'm an ex-con, remember that? Yes, of course, darling. You got out of jail, let's see. It was last, uh, what day was it? Last Friday. Oh, yes, that's right. But, darling, what does this have to do with you and then this Mr. Blaine's murder? Well, Blaine sent me to prison. Now the cops are trying to tie me up with his murder. Oh. Hmm. The paper says Blaine was knocked off at 3 o'clock yesterday. If I could just remember where I was then, I... Don't you know where you were, Harry? You were with me. Oh, yeah, yeah, but where? Uh... We weren't anywhere. We were out walking, that's all. Oh, yes, that's right. Where were we walking? Do you remember? Oh, not exactly. Downtown somewhere. Hmm. No, I've got to keep you out of this. I think I know what I'm going to do. What? I'm going to see a fellow named Boston Blackie. He helps guys like me. Oh, you can't leave here if the police are looking for you. Harry, I've met Blackie's friend, Mary Wesley. I know her. I'll get her to help me, and she'll get Blackie to help you. Now, Helen, please, can't you remember where you and Harry were, and and at least about what time it was? No, Mary, I can't. All I know is, is that we were out walking. Yes, but where, dear? Just downtown. That's a big help. Hmm. Now, look. Paul Blaine was murdered at 3 o'clock in a shop on 71st Street. Were you on 71st Street around 3 o'clock? Well, no. Oh, gosh, I'm beginning to sound like Blackie. Mary, I don't know where we were. I started out to see a man about fixing my coat. I think I have his address here in my purse. Oh, and well, this might minute. be something. Oh, dear. Oh, yes. Here's his address. 20th Street. All right, now you think you were on 20th Street? Yes. Down there somewhere. But I don't know. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's that other card in your purse? Where? Which one? Oh, yes, let's see. Oh, yes, I remember. A sidewalk photographer took our picture and gave us this check. Yesterday? Yes, while we were out walking. Yesterday afternoon. Hmm. Well, as Blackie might say when I show him this, it's a nice photograph. Let's hope it doesn't result in any negative development. Faraday speaking. Inspector Faraday, this is Rawlins. I'm calling from Blackie's apartment, and guess what I found? Guess. Guess? What am I? A guest star? What was it? A diamond. So what? Well, this diamond is listed as one of the things which should have been in Paul Blaine's pawn shop, but wasn't. Yeah? Yeah, and that means maybe Blackie was... Well, he, uh... He, uh, might have, uh... What are you talking about? Well, uh, you see, uh... <laughs> I get it. Blackie slipped up behind you and has a gun in your back, huh? <laughs> Some cop you are. I'll just put Blackie on the phone. Sure. Here, Blackie, he wants to talk to you. (laughs) Thanks, Rollins. And uh, don't go away yet. Okay. Hello, Inspector. Blackie, what is that diamond from Blaine's pawn shop doing in your apartment? It's all very simple, Inspector, but it'll sound complicated to you. Blaine gave it to me. Oh, yeah? When? At 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. 3 o'clock? That's when we think he was killed. And I got to tip you were there when it happened. Only I didn't believe it. Why not? I was there. A few minutes before and after the murder. What? And you didn't...
couldn't report it? No, Faraday, and you know why, too. It meant getting mixed up in this, which is something I didn't want to do. I didn't believe the tip I got, and I'll tell you something you won't believe. What? I believe you. How do you like that? Faraday, my, how you've changed. Uh, never mind about me. You sent Rollins back to headquarters, and with that diamond. All right. Bye. Goodbye. Rollins. Yeah, Blackie? Faraday wants you back at headquarters, and you can take this diamond with you. Sure. Okay, thanks a lot, Blackie. Good, uh... Oh, hello, Miss Wesley. Hello, Sergeant Rollins. Come in, Mary. The sergeant is just leaving. Yeah, so long. Bye. Well, Mary, I almost got mixed up in the Blaine murder. Rollins found that diamond Blaine gave me, and Faraday got a tip I was there when Blaine was killed. Oh, somebody's trying to frame you. Well, that means you'll help my friend Helen, doesn't it? What? What friend Helen? Helen Waltham, darling. The one I told you about on the telephone. Faraday thinks her fiancé, Harry Matthews, murdered Blaine. Oh. Oh, yes. Well, that means I... I'd better find an alibi for Matthews that will show him away from the scene of the crime at the time of the murder. Well, all right, then. I know this much, Blackie. Yesterday afternoon, Helen and Harry were walking on 20th Street. Now, that's about five miles from the scene of the crime. A sidewalk photographer took their picture. She thinks about 3 o'clock, and she had a receipt for it. I took that. Here. Picture, huh? Say, I'd like to see it. Maybe the shadows on the street or something on it would give Matthews an alibi. Yeah. It's awfully late. Photoshop is probably closed by now. But if we can get into the dark room, maybe we can bring an alibi for Matthews out into the light. How soon will the picture be developed, Blackie? Should be about now, Mary. I've had the print and the solution about, uh... Oh, I'm beginning to see something now. Good. I'm glad you took this claim check from Helen so we could find this picture. Hmm. Developing that print isn't taking as long as it took us to get in here. It was a tough lock on mm-hmm. the door, Mary. I had a hard time picking it. Yeah, you'll have to buy the photographer a new lock, won't you? <laughs> I suppose so. Now, let's hope this picture shows something that'll help us. All we know now is that it was taken the afternoon of the murder. Okay, I'm hoping... Look, Blackie, there's the whole picture now. It's clear, too. Mm-hmm. Now we'll lift it out of the solution and have a look at it. Here, I'll put it on the table here and hold it down with these weights so it won't curl while it dries. There. Well, it shows Helen and her friend Matthew's all right. Look behind Helen and our boyfriend, Mary. The Leeds Jewelry Store clock, and look at the time. Three o'clock. And Leeds Jewelry Store is on 20th Street, a good five miles from where Paul Blaine was killed. And at three o'clock... Tell your friend Helen not to worry, Mary. Our friend Harry Matthews is all right. The clear shot of the clock in this picture put him in the clear, too. May 21st, 1946. Boston Blackie on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, That sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Boston Blackie starring Dick Colmer from May 21st, 1946. Now back to Boston Blackie. Paul Blaine, pawnbroker, gets Blackie's help in returning a stolen diamond. Just after Blackie leaves him, however, Blaine is shot and killed. Police think Blaine was murdered by Harry Matthews, ex-con, who was sent to jail by Blaine. But with the help of his girlfriend, Helen Waltham, Matthews receives Blackie's help in proving his innocence. 
Blackie finds a sidewalk photographer's picture of Matthews near the Leeds jewelry store, five miles away from the murder scene, with the hands of the clock at three, which is the time Blaine was killed. So Matthews is obviously innocent. As we return to our story, Mary Wesley is at the Leeds jewelry store. And what can I do for you, miss? I'm not sure. Uh, are you Mr. Leeds? Yes, I am. Well, um, this may sound sort of silly, but... I'd like to know about that big clock out in front of his door. I hope you don't want to buy it. Oh, no, no. I just would like to know how accurate it is. Oh, it's the most accurate clock in town, miss. We have it checked once a week. It loses hardly a second. I see. When was it checked last? Uh, why, uh, four days ago. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, where's the nearest public phone? Oh, if you want to use a phone, you may use mine right there on the desk. Thank you. Oh, that's quite all right. Blackie, this is Mary. You found out about the clock? Yes, it's always right, and it was checked four days ago. Good. Now I'm absolutely sure Matthews is innocent. I'm going up to tell him for two reasons. To make him happy and Faraday miserable. All right, Matthews. You might as well talk. I didn't come to your apartment to outstay you. I don't have anything to talk about, Inspector Faraday. You killed Paul Blaine, so you ought to have a lot to talk about. I didn't kill him, Inspector. I, I admit I had a reason. He sent me to jail, but I didn't kill him. That's what they all tell me. Until I prove they're lying. Who's that at the door? One of your pals, Matthews? I don't know who it is. Well, go answer it. But no tricks. Don't worry. I don't have anything to hide. Is this Harry Matthews' apartment? Yes, I'm Harry Matthews. Blackie, for Pete's sake, what are you doing here? Just playing newsboy. Good newsboy, I might say. Blackie, I didn't kill Blaine. Don't let this guy arrest me. Don't worry, Harry. I wouldn't let Faraday do anything he'd be sorry for. Look, what do you mean, I'd be sorry? Harry here is the one who's going to be sorry. He's going to jail. Is he? When was Blaine killed? At three o'clock yesterday. You know that. All right. Take a look at this. What is it? A picture of Harry and his girlfriend walking down 20th Street a good five miles away from the scene of the crime. Taken yesterday, too. There's a date on it. Look. I am looking. So what? So look at the clock behind them. What time does it say? Well, I'll... It says three o'clock. That's right. And do you know what time it is now, Faraday? Huh? What's that it's got to do... It's time you apologized to an innocent man and got out of here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, I'm sorry, Matthews. Yeah, okay. And um, Blackie, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Mm. Thanks, Blackie. You're a big help to me. You've just cost me my only suspect. Don't fret, Faraday. What I take away, I usually put back. I've got another one for you. Come on, Harry. I'd like you to drive me down to see him right now. This is Blaine's pawn shop right here, Harry. Thanks for driving me. No, no, no trouble, Blackie. It was nice seeing you, Blackie. Thanks, Helen, and thanks for the lift. Okay. Oh, say, would you wait for me for a few minutes? I'm going to want to get to my bank, and I may not be able to get a car. Sure, sure, we'll wait, but you better hurry. The bank closes in a few minutes. I guess I shouldn't have stopped to pick up Helen. That's all right. We'll make it. How far do you bank? Down on 25th Street. The Weatherly National, Blackie? Yes, Helen. Why? Why, that's my bank, too. <laughs> well, we're practically partners, then, Helen. <laughs> yes. I'll be out in a minute. You want me to go with you? No, thanks, Matthews. I like to do things like this alone. Be right back. Hurry, or you'll be too late to get to the bank. All right. Good afternoon. Yeah? What's good about it? Well, that's fine talk. You own the shop? I'm John Blaine, if that's what you mean. I'm Boston Blackie. Hooray. So you're Boston Blackie. So what? So I'd like to talk to you. Maybe about the killing of your brother. What makes you think I killed him? You were having an argument when I called up yesterday afternoon and spoke to your brother. So what? So an argument could end in a killing. So could too much curiosity. Get out of here, Blackie. Fast. Now, is that a nice way to do business, John? Your brother Paul never pulled a gun on a visitor. Get out of here, I said. When I'm finished. You're finished now. Get out of here. Maybe this will help you move. You missed me, my friend. Or should I wait till I try to turn my head? I missed you because I wanted to. But next time, maybe I won't want to miss. Well, 
I wish I'd known you were having trouble with John Blaine, Blackie. I could have run out and given you a hand. I didn't mind arguing with him, Harry. It was the back talk from his gun I couldn't do anything about. Blackie, I want to thank you for helping Harry out of his trouble. Well, he's not out completely yet, Helen. What? He is, Blackie. Why isn't he? Oh, it's nothing to get excited about. I just wasn't able to prove John Blaine is a 100% suspect. And until I do, Faraday will always feel like Harry here is guilty. Well, as long as you believe I'm innocent... You're safe. Even Faraday has, has to face the facts. You couldn't have killed Blaine. You're too far away from the scene of the murder when Blaine was killed. Mm. Oh, say, it's too late for me to get to the bank, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it is. Oh, dear, that's a shame. It is after 3 o'clock, isn't it? Slightly. Say, do either of you have enough money to cash a check if it isn't too big? Well, all um, I've got is five. How about you, Helen? No, I don't think I... Oh, wait, I might have some. Yes, I... Why, yes, of course I do. Swell, could you spare 50, Helen? 50? I don't... Oh, what? oh, dear, what's the matter with me? I drew a hundred out of the bank yesterday. You did? Yes, it was yesterday. I remember I got to the bank just at closing time, and I had to argue with the man at the door to let me in. Here's the money you wanted, Blackie. Something just doesn't sound right here. I imagine Blackie's putting it all together, and we'll hear about that following these important words from your favorite station. We're listening to Dick Culmer's Boston Blackie from May 21st, 1946, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, Call right now to learn more about your risk free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk free offer. 800 738 5332. 800 738 5332. 800 738 5332. That's 800 738 5332. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Dick Colmer as Boston Blackie, originally broadcast May 21st, 1946. Oh, how much did you ask for? Just 50. Oh, yes, 40, 50. Here, you can make the check out later. All right, thanks. That's all right. I could give you more if you wanted it. No, thanks. You've given me plenty already. Sidewalk photographer must have a mania for putting fancy locks on his door. Mm-hmm. This one's tougher than the one I picked yesterday, Mary. Yeah, it sure seems to be. But what are we going to find by breaking into this dark room again? Oh, nothing much, Mary. Just this. How Helen Waltham could have been with Harry Matthews in front of Leeds Jewelry Store having a picture taken at 3 o'clock yesterday and still be in her bank at closing time. That's 3 o'clock. I know it's my bank, too. Mm. There, that opened the lock. Good. But about the time, that's impossible, darling. 
The clock on Leeds Jewelry Store is never wrong. I know it. But why would Helen say she was in her bank at closing time if she wasn't? She was very definite about that. Yeah, I know. Or so you said. Come on. Let's go into the dark room. I'm going to take a look at that picture again. All right. Wait, I'll turn on the light. There. Blackie, you think the picture of Harry and Helen was faked? We touched or something? No, it wasn't. Or I would have noticed it. The picture was real. The clock wasn't wrong. So there's only one answer to this whole thing. What? I said there's only one answer, Mary. I didn't say I knew what it was. Oh. Let's see. Do you remember the number of that picture of Harry and Helen? I sure do. 4121. Uh, yeah. Here's the index file. 4121. 4121. Where is that? Oh, here we are. Mm-hmm. It's a legitimate picture, all right. So where are we? Right back where we started. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Oh, wait a minute. I've got a hunch. This is picture 4121. Let's have a look at picture number 4120 and see what that looks like. Well, what do you think that'll show? Well, I don't know. That's why I want to look at it. 4120, 4120. Ah, here it is, already developed. Yeah? Taking it at the same spot. That's good. Let me look at it, too. A picture of a woman and a little girl. Well, that's not much. But, Mary, look at the clock behind them. For goodness sake, there's a man on a ladder doing something to it. Yes. Looks as if he's cleaning it. And look, Mary, look at the time. It's 3.30. 3.30? B- yes. And do you know what that means? It means the picture was taken before picture number 4120, and yet the clock says 3.30. So picture number 4121 showing Harry and Helen had to be taken after 3.30. Blackie. Then Harry could have killed Paul Blaine. He not only could have, Mary, but he probably did. That guy on the ladder there is obviously Harry's accomplice. He was planted to set back the clock so that Harry could have an alibi when his picture was taken. Wow. Wow is right. So it was Harry and not John Blaine after all. I should have known John acted too guilty to be guilty. Come on. It's going to hurt to do this, but I've got to call Faraday and tell him that he was right about Matthews. It's a lovely day for a walk, isn't it, Blackie? Beautiful, Mary. Is that beautiful, Mary, or beautiful Mary? (laughs) Take your choice. Well, I've taken it, and so I thank you, kind sir. Hey, Blackie. Yes? Why did Harry Matthews call Inspector Faraday and tell him you were at the scene of Paul Blaine's murder? Oh, that's easy, Mary. Two reasons. He wanted to involve me, and he wanted to make sure the police established the time of the murder at 3 o'clock. So his alibi with the fixed-up clock would stand up. He probably was hiding in the back of the pawn shop while we were talking to Paul Blaine the day of the murder. Oh, I see. That guy Matthews was clever, Mary. He never once offered an alibi. He knew it would be too phony if he did. He waited for me to supply it for him, and I did, by discovering that sidewalk photographer's picture. Yeah, he was clever, all right. He killed Paul Blaine for revenge, didn't he? But uh, he made one mistake, you know. Hmm? He didn't go to the trouble to find out where his friend Helen was at exactly three o'clock. No, thanks to her, we broke the case. I certainly was glad Faraday didn't involve her. Harry was obviously just using her. Here you are, lady. Blackie, did you see what just happened? What? A sidewalk photographer just snapped our picture. Well, how do you like that? Why does everything happen to us? Well, I don't know, but it certainly does. Blackie, tell me, how do sidewalk photographers like this fellow... Know whose picture to take. How? Well, Mary, that's simple. Snap judgment, that's all. Just snap judgment. (laughs) Crime fighter and punster, Boston Blackie. May 21st, 1946 on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? 
Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we start a brand new Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story. This one entitled The Tears of Night Matter was originally broadcast May 21st, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, This is Hillary Fuchs, CPA. You left word for me to call Mr. Dollar. I don't seem to recall the name. I'm with Universal Adjusters. They asked me to look into this Wendover claim. Universal Adjusters? Insurance Adjusters? That's right, insurance. I understand you filed a claim in Mrs. Wendover's name. Mrs. Wendover hired me to handle her affairs a few days ago. Who do you want to talk to, me or Mrs. Wendover? Anybody who can make me understand why Mrs. Wendover let a $50,000 policy lie around for two years before she filed a claim. I'll try. I don't know whether I can convince you or not, but I'll try. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. Expense account item one, $92.50, airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Miami Beach, Florida. My plane got in at 11 p.m., so I went to a hotel and got some sleep. I put in a call to Hillary Fuchs, certified public accountant, as soon as I woke up. Then I had some breakfast and took a cab out to his office. It was a pleasant four-mile trip along a beautiful white sanded ocean front, and it cost me item two, three bucks even. Come on in here, Dollar. The air conditioner's working here. Hillary Fuchs was a big man in his late 40s. He was semi-bald, had a good sunburn, and smelled faintly of scotch whiskey. The office he led me into was cool and dark and elegantly furnished in bamboo knickknacks. The desk was cluttered with a stack of financial statements and legal papers. This is quite a thing, I guess, Dollar. By the way, I didn't find any universal insurance adjusters in the phone book. We're located in Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford? You're a long way from home, Dollar. They sent you all the way to Miami Beach about this? Yep. Seems like a pretty expensive way to handle it. Pretty expensive claim. $50,000. Would it do any good to tell you it's legitimate? Sure. But I'm hired to check it out just the same. (laughs) In other words, you don't believe me. Well, look at it our way, Mr. Fuchs. The claim came into the office day before yesterday, and we have 72 hours to act on it. Okay. What can I do? First off, tell me your connection with Mrs. Wendover. She hired me to put her business affairs in order about 10 days ago. First time I ever saw her. She said the Treasury Department had advised her to get some expert help. They were on her about back taxes, and that's it. Oh, I see. Tell me about Noah Wendover's death. He died two years ago, last April 14th. By the way, it's just coming to me... Did you people... I mean, did the insurance company know anything about him being dead until that claim came in? No. (laughs) No wonder they sent you all the way from Hartford. Well, uh, Wendover and his wife took a party of eight out on their boat for a ten-day cruise. Wendover had an attack of appendicitis at sea. There wasn't a doctor aboard. The appendix burst, and he died before they could make the nearest port. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to the original question... Why all this time before Mrs. Wendover filed claim for benefits? Well, you really got to know Mrs. Wendover, I guess. She's a little crazy, a little wacky, a little strange. These are your impressions of her? It's a consensus. I asked her around after she came here the other day. The story is that she and Wendover had a pretty good thing in their marriage. They were wild about each other. They spent money like water, and they had plenty of it to spend. Then one day he died. Kind of threw her. Maybe it's still throwing her. I don't know. Sure, sure. Somewhere along the line, in the last year, Mrs. Wendover's met somebody else. Oh? I don't know who he is because I wasn't paying any attention when she mentioned his name. But she's sort of coming out of it and she's going to marry him. Uh-huh. So she wants to get her business affairs in order. From the look of things, nobody's done much about them since Wendover's death. 
You see all that stuff in the desk? Yeah, I noticed it. It's all hers. She brought it to me in three big hat boxes. Stocks, bonds, bills, deeds, I don't know what all. I know she's in a little trouble with the government. Not because she hasn't got the money to pay them, but just because she hasn't bothered with anything like that. Hmm? Anyhow, one of the first things I came across was the insurance policy thrown in there with all the rest of the stuff. And look, you see these checks? Yeah. Almost $90,000, dividends on some oil stock. Doesn't even bother to open or mail or cash her checks. <laughs> well, a lot of people around the country, including your insurance company, are going to be startled when I finish straightening all this out. I sent the policy claim in as a matter of course. That's my explanation for it being two years late. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good explanation. Look here. She completely forgot she loaned an $8,000 automobile to a friend in Tampa 14 months ago. I asked her about it, and she said she thought she'd left it at the filling station. What? And here... The boat went over Didon, worth $60,000. She sold it to a fisherman last year for $5,000. Yeah, I get the idea, Mr. Fuchs. Yeah. So you filed the insurance claim in her name along with a dozen other matters that should have been taken care of two years ago. Yeah. You play golf? No. Well, I do, and I'm tired of looking at this pile of stuff. Mind if I look at it? Help yourself. All yours. I'll be at the club. Do whatever you have to. By the way, what do you have to do? Verify this death certificate in the coroner's report. Well, then you will honor the claim? I'll file my report, and it's up to the insurance company to do as they see fit. You're kind of cagey, aren't you? Uh, that's why they pay me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Mr. Fuchs. Yeah? Is there some kind of bank balance in this stuff, current? Well, you'll find it there, but I'll tell you, in cash, Mrs. Wendover's worth about $950,000. I doubt very much if she's trying to cheat the insurance company out of 50000 You can't ever tell, though, can you, Mr. Fuchs? Nope. Can't ever tell. After he left, I got on the telephone and talked to officials about the coroner's autopsy and the death certification on Noah Wendover. They all seemed to be in order. Then I went through the papers on Fuchs' desk. They seemed to be in enough disorder to verify what he told me about Elise Wendover. I left Fuchs' office about 4.30 and went back to my hotel, carrying a picture of a woman who had existed in a state of limbo for two years or more, so far as responsibility and attention to business went. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hillary Fuchs, can you come over to my office right away? I just left there. What's up? Mrs. Wendover, she's having a fit. Come on over. <laughs> Expense account item three, three more bucks, more cab fare, back to Hillary Fuchs' office. I pulled up in front at exactly 5.30 and noticed a 1956 white Cadillac convertible parked in front. For no reason at all, I took 30 seconds to peek inside. The registration told me the car belonged to Elise Blair Wendover. She had left her purse on the seat and the keys in the ignition. A mink stole was thrown carelessly over the back of the seat. Anybody could have taken the stole, the purse, the car, the whole works. Mrs. Wendover was living up to her advance notices. Come in, come in. Fuchs looked pale and shaken. He fumbled around for a cigarette until I handed him one of mine. He lit it up and tried to get a grip on himself. Mrs. Wendover's in there. Oh, what happened? Well, I had some papers for her to sign, and she dropped in a little while ago. Uh -huh. I told her about you. I, I explained to her it was certainly reasonable the insurance company would want to investigate a claim that had been delayed 25 months. Well? She blew up, got kind of hysterical about it, said she wanted to see you right away, that she had something to tell you. Go easy on her, will you? Well, why do you say that? Oh, it's just that, well, if I'm wrong about her, I'm glad, but I don't think I'm wrong when I say she's right on the edge, just on the edge of it. it Feeling better, Mrs. Wendover? The pale girl with the coal black hair, seated stiffly in the chair in front of Hillary Fuchs' desk, was not feeling better here. She could have been 16 or 36. It depended on where you were standing when you looked at her. She had a mouth that was too full, shoulders too wide for the strapless sundress, a pair of sandals, a clanking costume bracelet, and black eyes, round, big, bright, too bright. This is Mr. Dollar, Mrs. Wendover. I understand you're investigating my husband's death. I'm here to verify the facts so that eastern states can act on your claim. Don't you believe he's dead? Yes. Don't you? Oh, yes. I saw him die. Yes, he's dead. How much money do you owe me? The claim is for $50,000. Will you pay it? 
Well, I, I presume it will be paid from all I've seen so far. Of course, that part of it's up to the insurance company. Of course. And they have men sitting at desks reading reports about claims all day long. Ah, uh, yes. My dad owned an insurance company once, you know. Those men sitting at their desks, even my dad sat at a desk. I wonder something. Would one of those men sitting at one of those desks write, okay, on my claim for Noah's benefits if he knew about me? Uh, sit down, Mrs. Wendover. Maybe you'd like a drink. You have one, Mr. Fuchs, would they? Well, I, I have to be indefinite about that, too, Mrs. Wendover. What would put a question in the mind of an adjuster if he knew about you? I'm indolent. And I'm irresponsible. Mr. Fuchs can tell you that. I'm not quite dependable, am I, Mr. Fuchs? Oh, we're getting straightened out, Mrs. Wendover. And then, of course, that wouldn't make a difference. I mean, not really. A great many irresponsible, indolent, undependable people file claims. There's something else. I'm a curse. Are you? Oh, yes. It's a very bad thing, a curse... People around me, people I love, just seem to die. Well, why do you think you're a curse? Noah died, and I loved him. And Daddy, I loved him. And my brother Jim, all dead. No one can stay alive around me. I thought I should tell you that. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, Mrs. Wendover. Well, then we don't have anything more to discuss. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Fuchs. Oh, wait a minute. Johnny, hey, where are you going? I'm going to drive her home. You were right. She's on the edge of something. I can't quite figure it yet. Her brother was killed in Korea. Her father died of a heart attack ten years ago. I got that much from the papers on your desk. Lord, where'd she ever get the idea? Oh, that... I don't know. I've heard of things like this happening. I'll phone you later. Right. Wait a minute. I'll drive you home, Mrs. Wendover. Oh, that'll be nice. She smiled brightly, still too brightly, and we drove along. She didn't tell me which way to turn, what direction to go, and I didn't ask her. I liked it that way, no one saying a word. I was listening to something else anyhow, something inside of me, loud like a cannon firing twice a second. It was my heart making all the noise. Oh, it's happened a couple of times before, and it meant trouble coming up. I knew it. My heart never makes a mistake. Mr. Dollar, do you think he'll die, too? Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, right out in the broad daylight, I have a look at the tears of night. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Something tells me this is going to be one of those stories that has more twists and turns than a winding mountain road. From uh, May 21st, 1956, uh, just a few days after I was born, Years, two days after I was born, in fact, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Many of these shows are provided to us by our good friend Ted at RadioMemories.com, where he provides radio programs on cassette, CD, or on flash drive for your computer. That's RadioMemories.com. Thank this radio station. Support their advertisers, would you please? It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around on your favorite station. Uh, you, if you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single show. You can find them at uh, Spotify, Spreaker, 
Tune in, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon. Search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, or even easier, go to my webpage, classicradio.stream. There you can stream shows on demand. You can learn more about Classic Radio Collection. Find our social media links where we post links to our shows every day. And you can contact me there, classicradio.stream. Thanks for listening. Tell your friends the great radio shows are here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.